Well, good morning. We were flying out of Heathrow not too long ago, and we were taking off. We were somewhere over the Thames estuary, and I happened to glance out of the window. It was quite, for once, quite a nice, clear, sunny day. And I could see this little white shape out in the ocean. And I'm sort of looking a bit harder, and I could see a few more shapes and a few more. And I realized there are rows of them, these little white sticks going off as far as I can see. And it kind of took me a minute, um, but I realized these things were wind turbines. And what I was looking at was this massive grid of wind turbines just going off into the ocean. Um, I've realized since, well, I've been told by people I work with, what I was looking at was what's called the London Array. It's the largest offshore wind farm in the world, and it just happens to be right outside London. So I was interested, and working where I do, it was quite easy to go and dig up a few more details. So I went back to work and I asked around. Turns out this thing cost two billion pounds to build. Turns out there are 175 of these turbines, each one taller than the London Eye, all standing in 25 meters of water. And on a windy day, when the whole thing's up and running, it's going to power over a million UK homes. So we're at, we're at UX Design Talk. Why am I throwing some stats at you? I wanted to get across that these things aren't just built for ideological reasons. They've got to be reliable. They've got to be efficient. And they've got to make money as a business, too. Otherwise, these things aren't going to get built in the first place. So we'll look at a couple of other big renewable projects. That guy in the high-vis jacket is standing inside a single one of the three blades of the world's largest wind turbine. That thing is the world's largest single moving part. It's actually built now. It's on a big wind turbine off the coast of Scotland. And on a windy day, the tip of it is going to move at 180 miles an hour. <laughs> if you were a pilot you're flying an Airbus A380, and assuming that thing wasn't spinning too fast, you could fly the Airbus A380 in between those blades, and you'd still have room to spare on either side of the wingtips. I want to get across, sometimes these things are really big. <laughs> and they've got to be built to last as well. If you buy a new car, from the day you get it off the forecourt to the day it ends up on the scrap heap, it's designed, more or less, to do about nine months of reliable running. So if you bought a new car, got off the forecourt, fired up the engine, started driving, and assuming you didn't need to have a toilet break or go to sleep, you could go for about nine months before it would start to break down. Wind turbines, by contrast, have got to manage 20 years at a minimum to be considered acceptable. And that's out in the wild with everything Mother Nature and storms can throw at it. So these things have got to last. The reason I'm bringing all this up is, well, I've been a UX designer in this industry for a couple of years, and it was that flight over the Thames estuary that reminded me why I took the job in the first place. Really big challenges, both in engineering and in software, and I think a really worthwhile end goal. Hello, I'm Matt Checker, and this is Matt Corral, and uh, we both work for DMVGL. It's an engineering firm who help to design and build um, renewable energy projects such as the London Array. Uh, today we're going to give you the kind of talk that we thought we would like to listen to. We're going to show you how UX design works in the renewable industry. Um, it's probably an industry that is a bit different to what is normal for most, most designers in this room. We want to try and tell you a real story about how our company learned to build better software using agile and UX techniques. And finally, we want to give you some practical advice that you can take away. Um, so we're going to tell you the seven UX activities that have worked well for us, and one of the ones that didn't. The engineers trying to solve the big challenges that Matt's just talked about are our users. Every day they need a number of software tools to perform their job, but they need professionals to build those tools, and that's where we come in. Our team is based in Bristol and has 20 developers, six product owners, two testers, two designers, UX designers, and a product architect. Together we look after around a dozen uh, software products and services for the renewable industry. By the standards of most software teams, our, users, our user, we have a relatively small number of users, but their use of our tools has a massive impact on the renewable industry as a whole. All our users are highly educated, um, they're specialists in their field, and they expect the software to keep up with all the latest technical innovations so they can sleep, keep ahead of the game. 
They also love to tinker and to solve problems. If software doesn't do what they want, they're likely to code something themselves, augmenting our products with add-ons made in Excel or MATLAB, for instance. This happens a lot, and we have to take this into account in our development. To ensure we make the right products, we're co-designing every week with around 120 users, and we also test with these people as well. They're based in Bristol and all around the globe, from solar farm designers in Barcelona to weather modeling experts in Shanghai. Two years ago, this collaboration wasn't happening, and we're going to tell you how that all changed. One of the software products we make is a desktop application called Wind Farmer. It allows engineers to design wind farms and estimate the amount of energy they might produce over the lifetime of the farm. It's been around for about 15 years and is highly regarded for the quality of its energy estimates. A couple of years ago, it was this product that first brought it, myself and Matt together, and it quite quickly became the proving ground for trying out new techniques and a flagship for what we can achieve as a team. The screenshot you're looking at is what Wind Farmer looked like about nine years ago when I first started working on it as a software developer. It was a market leading tool, um, and it was actually ahead of its time, not just for its numeric prowess, but also its user interface. Um, users were able to use it to design their wind farms using 2D and 3D maps. But within a few years, the world moved on quite rapidly, and everyone was using uh, great web and mobile software. And Tools like Google Earth came along and suddenly um, our product felt very dated and we couldn't keep up as a team. So our sales, our sales slowed down uh, despite being in a growing market and the development team were forced to focus, um, forced to focus and take a good long look at what was going on. We knew we needed to deliver improvements faster and we knew that we needed to be more in tune with our users. We decided that becoming an agile software team was the right way to go about this. Over the course of the next five years, bit by bit, we got the hang of agile software development. We fixed our efficiency problems, and we created a vibrant open culture where people enjoyed working. We started to replace the old Wind Farmer user interface with one that was more modern and would let us maintain it more easily and add some fancy graphics, make it nicer for the user. But as good as all this was, we still weren't getting quite the right vibes from our users. We could see we weren't quite building the right products. To try and fix this, the developers in the team uh, attended a short UX design course and started to try and talk to um, our users. But this had mixed results. Um, by now, I had evolved into um, being a scrum master and was separately trying to make some sense of a large pile of user stories that supposedly represented our product. In doing this, I discovered Jeff Patton's slides on story mapping, and we began story mapping out Wind Farmer with our product owner. It was a slow and rather brain-melting exercise to start with. Um, we were constantly having to ask ourselves, what is the user actually trying to do here? But it seemed like it was valuable, so uh, we had some good results. Uh, we decided that it was worth taking this, this practice on and doing it on another product. So the second product, this time around, the product owner had been a user of the product for several years previous to becoming the product owner, and it was a quick and easy process. At that moment, everything became very clear to us. We thought we understood our users, but we really didn't. As a team, we'd done all the right things, but in the end, we realized we needed an expert. So, Matt joined us and was very quickly uh, the catalyst that took us on to new levels of sophistication and understanding, but there were still challenges ahead. This is kind of where I came into the story. This was a couple of years ago. Um, I spent my first month in the job without a clue what anyone was saying or what was going on around me whatsoever. <laughs> I, from a design background, I had no experience in renewable energy. and There was all this jargon that just made no sense whatsoever. But when the guys show me the products, this is a couple of products I was faced with on my first day. Um, I was really enthusiastic because I knew I'd found this really meaty, interesting challenge to tackle, even if it made no sense at first. We look after a whole range of products. They're mostly desktop and web applications. They've got a lot of history. Um, a lot of them have been built by separate teams over the years. And a lot of them started life being built by experts for experts. 
They're quite complex. And over the years, they've only grown more complex. As the wind and the solar industries have matured, there have been more demands, features and things have been added on. So all that history and complexity makes for this really rich and interesting challenge for any UX designer. But I was, as I was coming to learn once I started, it requires a slightly different approach to something like, say, a corporate website or a shopping app. This grand old building is St. Vincent's Works. This is the old DNVGL office. It's right behind Temple Meads. Um, we've moved, since moved to a nice new office, but this I wanted to show you to get across the point that we had users and developers sat on opposite sides of the same building, and yet we still had a communication problem. We were, well, the developers didn't really know that much about their users. The users didn't really have a good channel by which to give feedback and ideas. So I started doing my user research, started learning how people work. I was trying to plug the gaps in our knowledge. What really shocked me when I got into it was we actually had users who were going to some effort to avoid using the user interface altogether. Um, remember we said earlier, our users, that they're, they're real geeks. They love problem solving. They love tinkering. And if the problem, if the product doesn't really deliver what they need, they're going to take matters into their own hands. Now, we, we knew they were doing a bit of that, but it was the research that really revealed the scale of the problem. What we decided, though, was that Wind Farmer wasn't a bad product. It was just off target. It kind of became clear very quickly I was going to have to find a way for these two groups to communicate more effectively. We, as a software team, needed to build confidence we were building the right product, and we were going to need a structured design process to get there. So the team were already working in the agile way and doing it pretty well. Um, but in some ways, we were limited by the, the culture of the company around us. We, we still had managers who were plan planning and budgeting projects around features and tech specs rather than considering users from the outset. Often when Matt and I would try to go to do user research, we'd be confronted with someone's line manager waving the sort of feature request list at us rather than the direct contact we so badly needed. People didn't really know what to make of this new way of working that we were trying. So we knew that if we were going to be truly effective, we were going to have to change not just our culture, but the way the company around us thought about software. But we just didn't have that much influence to start with, and it was going to have to be one small step at a time. So I drew a lot of icons. I got asked to do loads of icons, so I, I responded to requests. I made little <coughs> tweaks to UIs. But whenever opportunity presented itself, Matt and I would get together, and we would try applying some of the techniques that we've been reading about. And Wind Farmer was our first real chance to experiment, try out some of these techniques. But because of the nature of the software, the complex stuff we were making, we didn't really know what techniques were going to stick. Some of them fell flat. Some of them really did work. And about a year into experimenting with these things, we'd really started to identify the techniques that were working for us. So today we're going to go through the seven techniques that really worked and the one that really didn't. So. Quite early on in the project, I was asked to go to an annual general meeting where all the regional sales reps from Wind Farmer were gathered in one place. They were all flying to Bristol. And the idea was that I was going to introduce myself to the wider team. And I didn't. I thought, I can do more with this. So I sort of hijacked the meeting. And I ran this spontaneous persona workshop instead. So we got all the sales team out their seats, gave them all post-its. And they looked at the post-its a bit strange. What's this? But you know, it was all new. And we used their direct experience with customers to build personas and to set user goals for Wind Farmer. Because the team hadn't really had much chance to contribute to the design process before, they were really enthusiastic. <coughs> it took us a little bit over an hour till we had personas and user goals we could start working with. So we knew who our users were and we knew what their goals were, but we didn't really understand that much yet about how they used the product. So I started calling people, and I started doing user interviews. I got them to show me how they work, use screen sharing to sort of see what was going on. And I learned that because the design of a wind farm is quite a step-by-step -step thorough process, that doing some task mapping was a really good way to get that across. So the kind of thing you're seeing was the output of that research. I was looking at tasks they were performing, priority. I was looking at where they struggled, where things went very well. Um, and I was trying to identify places where we thought, with our new redesign of the software, that we could save time or add a bit of value to them. And what was nice about this was, for the first time, the whole development team 
could look and could get a good understanding of how different people were using their software. And we could start to appraise how we were doing. Where are we strong? Where have we got an opportunity to do better? So we were gradually building up this picture where we're getting the information we need to make informed decisions about the redesign. So the next thing that happened is we had this product owner, and he used to think really long and hard about wind farmer, and he had a ton of really good ideas. Problem was that not many of those ideas were making it through to the product. He had this great vision in his head, and he was struggling to communicate it in a way that the team could understand. Breakthrough came when I got my Sharpies, got my paper, sat down with him, and I got him to describe it, and we started sketching. And as we sketched these things, these sort of rough UI mock-ups, we'd stick them up on the wall, like that picture up there on the top left, and we deliberately put them next to the kitchen so that when people went to get coffee, they'd have to walk past these things. Now, unlike a digital file, it's kind of hard to ignore them, especially when you're on a coffee break. And we found that quite quickly, we had these little spontaneous gatherings happening. You know, teams of developers, product owners would gather around, start drawing their own ideas, adding their comments. What this did really well was we very quickly got the vision out of our product owner's head and into a format that the whole team could understand and start building on. So another thing we kind of struggled with was, um, are we making something that's intuitive? Are we user-friendly? We have a lot of you know, requirements to do something user-friendly. Uh, but no real idea whether we were doing that or what, and what that was. Without anything really concrete to go on, it was only until we had a release that we really knew how we were doing. Um, and we'd have these meetings that would just drag on and on for hours as people all arguing the case, how we're doing. It was introducing user testing that just cut all of that short um, and did quite a lot to de-risk the product as well. So the way we did it is we'd get into coding, and as soon as we had a functional prototype in real code that users could use to go through their entire workflow, so on that task map earlier, an entire complete workflow, we'd get it in their hands and we'd start testing. So I was doing a simple usability test. I was getting people to do it with the old product and the new so that we could benchmark. And I was looking at things like time taken, do they get stuck anywhere, where are they frustrated, or Actually, where are they pleasantly surprised as well? Because we have those too. And for the first time, we were finding a way that we could start measuring subjective things like usability. Because we were comparing to the old product, we could prove that we were improving on what had come before. And by doing this early, we were spotting problems, and we were able to address them in the next sprint. Because we were quantifying all these subjective things, we were starting to convince people outside of the team, actually, this whole UX business might be onto something. Through doing all that testing, we, um, we had another unexpected lesson, um, and that was the value of, of what we would call user advisors, especially in the design of complex engineering applications. So we're a software team. We know what we're doing there, but we're not wind turbine experts or solar experts. And if we need to learn more about weather modeling or the right way to wire up a solar farm, we need to go and ask the advice of domain experts. Um, sometimes that can be the product owner, but in the case of Wind Farmer, we needed a bit more advice. So we found ourselves relying on Tom here more and more. Tom was a really enthusiastic Wind Farmer user. He'd been using it for years, and he had a good understanding of the engineering theory behind it. So what we had was Tom would come and sit with the team part-time, and he would co-design with us. He was able to really quickly distill a lot of information down for us. And he was able to help us know that we were up to date with sort of the current best practice. That did so much to focus the design effort that we now make a point of doing it all the time. So we've built this network of specialist advisors around our company. It's a big company. There are several thousand people, so there are quite a few of these dotted around. Um, and we can call on them any time for technical advice or even get them to come and sit with the team part-time if we need them to. The other thing that made a big difference for me, well, it stemmed from a desire to go home at 5 o'clock a bit more often than I was. Um, there are now two of us in the UX design role. When I started, there was just me. Uh, I would get pretty overworked at times. So I started teaching developers who were interested some user research techniques. And the idea was that the guys could lighten the load by doing their own user testing, going and doing their own bit of research. And it really seemed to take hold. And people seemed to be really keen. So we started extending the lessons and started teaching how to turn research findings into user stories, even how to do some basic UI design using PowerPoint as your tool. 
what I found was that when more of the team were empowered to do that UX stuff, when they felt that they could, um, we were better off for it. The designer didn't have to be the bottleneck anymore. Because we were all having more direct contact with users, there was more empathy. Um, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in meetings describing what users had said to me and what had happened, but we didn't need to spend the time on it because we'd all seen for ourselves. The other really unexpected thing was this thing about ownership. So I, I used to make my prototypes, hand them over to the guys and say, right, this is what I recommend we try for the next release. This time round, because we'd all contributed to the design, there was more of a sense of ownership of it. It wasn't just my thing. Um, so I learned a really valuable lesson that sometimes if the designer relinquishes control of it, lets the team own it, we actually get to where we need to be a lot quicker. Another practice that we find gets everyone engaged and um, energized is story mapping. We started doing this a year or so ago when, um, before Matt joined us. We found it useful, but to be honest, um, it's much easier and vastly more valuable when you're doing it with the results of some of the UX activities that Matt's just run through, um, task profiling in particular. So for those of you who don't know, um, to create a story map, we look at each persona, we write down all of the tasks that the user needs to do to achieve their goals. Um, these will become our user stories later on. We group those up into workflows, and we then organize those into different piles that we call activities, which are just sort of we give some meaning to them. Um, and then we put the most important workflows on top, and that's the essence of a story map. It's a prioritization of user stories. Quite frequently, Matt and I will do this as part of a two to three day workshop uh, with the key users and stakeholders. We find this is more efficient. We've also learned that this is a great time to do some uh, concept design sketch-ups uh, because that helps to inform the story map and the, the story map helps to inform the sketch-up. This also helps to unlock the user's thinking sometimes. At the end of all this, we can visualize the size, scope and complexity of the product and we can read it to tell the story to the rest of the team and other key stakeholders. We can read along the top of a story map to tell a simple story or we can delve into the, the subtasks to tell more complicated ones whenever we need to. So that might be during the sprint, for instance. Later on, the development team will use the story map to plan, prioritize, and track the construction of the project as well. They can use it to identify key user journeys, and we can use those for more targeted testing. We don't have a great amount of testing resource. So to us, a user journey would be which particular tasks a user does in particular order to achieve one of their goals. At any time, any member of the team can look at the story map and see that the state of the product or what it represents. We've just run through the seven practices that we found worked really well. There was one, there were a few that didn't work, but there was one in particular that wasn't great. Um, this was our attempt at having a design spec. Uh, within the first few months of Matt being with us, we were um, getting some good results, but the overall user experience of the product was slightly patchy and perhaps a bit incoherent. Developers were working on user stories, but there wasn't a clear design vision for them to follow. In particular, there were no UI design patterns at all. As Matt was from an agency background, uh, we thought that producing a design spec was the way to go, but being agile, we thought we should try and make this lightweight. So that's what we did. Um, the spec was successful. It gave us a coherent vision for the first time, but it didn't quite fit with our agile practices um, an agile process, it was still too big. Uh, it was too big, Matt spent a lot of time trying to maintain it, and the developers um, still found the document too big to really fancy reading it. So it was a little bit of a flop, so yeah. we had to find something else. And we eventually settled on the pairing that works really well for us. This is an interactive Axia prototype and a story map. The Axia prototype um, the story map tells us what the users need to do and when, and the actual prototype uh, tells us, tells the developers how they'll need to do it. These are a living visualization, a visualized specification that's constantly updating as we learn more about the product. We don't have any big documents, we just have these. Um, we maintain them digitally um, because we have um, team members spread across the globe. Where possible though, we'll try and put paper copies up in the team areas because we find that they naturally gravitate towards these when they talk about their work. 
For the first time, it's now possible for everyone in our teams to have an understanding of what the product is. Or if they don't have an understanding, they have a reference point to go to to get that understanding. So we've talked a lot about what's worked for us. Um, we haven't mentioned when, and that's quite important. As my role as a Scrum Master, it's I'm trying to make everything as efficient as possible. And getting some of these things done at the wrong time could have a big impact on the efficiency of the team. Before we uh, release, we go through what we call um, a product definition phase. So we involve a small subset of, of the team doing user research, concept designs, looking at the priority and the scope of the, this particular release. This could last one to two months for an existing product or three to six months for a new product. Uh, the key outputs of this are the actual prototype and the story map or updates to those. It's important to say that we don't try and make these perfect, we just aim to get enough detail so that we can understand the product and the design to enable the development team to go and do technical investigations to de-risk the development phase. When we move into the development phase, we do what we call deep dive UX activities. Um, normally, this is one sprint ahead of the development, and this is the dual track scrum style. So this is when we look at the finer details of the, the design or the story map, and we use our user advisors and our product owners to do this. This provides the details when they're most relevant, it makes them more digestible, and it stops a team getting too much information up front at the start of the project and getting swamped by that. Of course, the developers still need uh, design input from, on a day-to-day -day basis, but this is more in the form of uh, seeking cl clarification on something or uh, an unforeseen problem, or in Matt's case, asking for lots of icons. Yeah, it still happens. Most of the work is done in the definition phase, or in the um, preparatory sprint. Okay. So about 18 months after we started that project, we got to a point where we very proudly released uh, the new Wind Farmer as a beta for our users to trial. Um, we learned so much over the course of it that we had ideas that could carry, we could carry on developing for ages. Um, but we proved something. We delivered good software. People were using it. Um, managers who previously might not have placed that much trust in us now financially back to two-year roadmap development based on the strength of that beta. Um, so critically, we delivered, we'd ship. We proved that we could be fast and responsive. We proved that we could listen and involve our users in the process. We proved that we could innovate, moving away from old products if we needed to, and actually delivering something that might exceed expectations. And critically, we proved that UX research and design made a measurable benefit that was worth investing in. We'd sort of found as well that our reputation around the company had started to change too. Yeah, thanks. People start to trust us more. People will come to us more early on in projects now and ask us how to define a product and what it should be, rather than simply telling us. We've got more autonomy, so we can start to define the way we want to work in our company. And now if people do come to us with feature spec docs, which does still happen, we're able to push back and we're able to Ask for the definition phase is a better way to go about the project. Really start to see a difference within our team as well. So the sketches and the story maps up on the wall, they kind of encourage this more open, transparent culture. So we're different software teams are more likely to cross-fertilize now. Everybody's got the skills to engage with users directly, or most of us do, be they product owners or developers. So if we need to be put on the design hat and be a designer for a day, we feel empowered to do that. And everybody understands UX, when to use it, and how to use it. We sort of found that by tackling the Wind Farmer project, we'd become more confident as a team in what we were doing. And when Matt and I were talking about it, putting this together, we decided that was probably one of the key things that had got us to success in the company we're in. That confidence was protecting the way we were working, and it was giving us more control over the products we were delivering. So in summary, well, renewables isn't really an industry you usually associate with UX, but we've managed to make quite an impact with what we were doing. There's a very technical focus, there's very high stakes projects, so we've really had to prove ourselves, and it's by delivering that software and by measuring the benefit that we've convinced those around us that it's worthwhile. The designer and the developer, well, the reason we're standing up here together is to really make the point that working together with Agile and UX integrated, we're much more effective, and we've even started to see the boundaries between our roles starting to blur as people take on research and design activities. That really works for us. Everybody understands the story of the product, why we're making it, what value it delivers. 
that means that we always get a better product out of it and we get there quicker than we would do otherwise. And that's especially apparent when we have direct contact with users. We start to see these ripples of a culture change in our company. We're kind of going from more of a tech-led group to more of a user-focused group. Um, and we're making big changes. And the, you know, the senior management in our company is starting to buy into it too. So it's quite exciting for us to see where we go next with this kind of thing. That's it from us. Thank you very much.